hell, that was that, that anticlimactic. Didn't happen like it was supposed to. <laughs> it's you know, it was at five, five, and then it went to quiet. Huh. Anyways, let's get this rolling here. That was disastrous. Welcome to Tuesday Night Live. I'm Eric. We've got oh, Dave. So I gotta get the fingers pointing. Hey, there's Dave. Mark Easy. Otis yes. Whitefish down there. We got David Bonica and uh, Dave's. Yeah, there he is. That quarter. And yeah. the legendary, the one, the only, F. Bonnie. <laughs> Anyways, tonight we're going to be talking. If you've read the, uh, the the post that I've been making, we're going to talk about service writing and how it can actually add value to your enterprise. I know, hard to believe, isn't it? But anyways, before we get started, let's kick it off to Otis Whitefish. He's got something incredible to tell us about an event coming up very shortly, possibly tomorrow. Tomorrow? Oh, well, tomorrow night. I got all sorts of events. I'm going, oh, crap, he got me on the corner. What are we doing? <laughs> coming out fighting. Um, tomorrow night, yeah, we've got our uh, class for input sensors and output actuators. Bobby and I are going to be teaching. I think we ended up with about 12 in the class because a couple wanted to sneak in and we didn't want to tell them no, so... But we're excited about that. Um, that's one of the three class series that we have. And, of course, Bobby and I are working on some additional classes. Um, I think we've even talked to Zach about doing a class. So we've got some classes coming up from EVAP to lab scopes to I'm going to do a GDI class. And uh, we're going to have some fun. Fantastic. And we're already fighting in the chat bleachers. Can you believe that? I love it. Bring it hey, on, this guys. This time Kevin Meyer got the coveted position of number one commenter. Way to go, Kevin. <laughs> Yay, Kevin. I was too busy yelling at uh, Bobby because, uh, you know, <laughs> he would have had it first. Oh, we even got Chaz. Welcome, Chaz. Welcome to the Tuesday Night Live where we're talking service writers. Awesome, Chaz. <laughs> Anyways, David, Yay, let's have you introduce David yourself. Kelly. Tell us who you are, a little bit about yourself, and all those juicy details. <clears throat> oh, easy enough. My name is Dave. I've been, uh, oh, damn, I've been in the automotive industry too damn long. Uh, been a service writer now for about 10 years. I started off as a lot boy for a BMW dealership, worked my way up through their parts department, said, screw this crap. I want to fix cars, went and fixed cars, worked my way up through Cadillac. And then about 2010, 2011, I was like, you know what? I don't want to be a miserable, broken, beat up old person. I'm going to take a nice, easy job, like being a service advisor where all I get to do is relax and other people make me money. And that's when I made my last mistake. <laughs> so how's that working out for you? Well, as of uh, as of today, so far, I haven't been convicted of any murder charges. Come close on a few assault charges. But, you know, for the most part, people seem to like me. <laughs> a few close calls there, of course. You know, it's things that can happen at the shop usually get settled at the shop. So, you know, cops don't usually need to get involved. Mm. Those kinds that of things. That's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> my cohort can can attest. I had a little bit of a cohort when I was a technician, and uh, more than once I got into it with the service advisor and managed to convince them, you know, verbally that their jobs were easy and they were just basically secretaries, and all I had to do was stay behind the desk, shut up, and let the real people do their real jobs. Uh, that sometimes resulted in me throwing hammers or uh, trying Ooh. to people in cars and yeah like i said it's i wanted an easy job so i became a service advisor okay. uh, um and that's and part of the, what an asshole you've been to all of those people for all of those years yeah and every now and then i'll deal with a customer or technician i'm like oh this is payback isn't it okay karma i see i see you i got you um but that's, I guess that's a common misconception in the industry is that, that service writers are really just service secretaries. We're just there to smile at customers and, and hand the keys off and so the techs don't have to get paper cuts or wash their hands or deal with anybody. And, and I've worked with a lot of service advisors and in a lot in, in some places where they tend to be that. They're not brought in. They're not trained. They're not properly kind of taught the nuances of how to do the job properly. And those are, the, those are the guys that you see that either they, they wash out or they very quickly turn into the guys that just, just there's, there, there's no money in this. I'm just going to sit here and tell people how to do their job. And it's it's not the way to do it because, like I said in the chat a couple of weeks ago, it's more about being an advocate for the guys that are working behind the scenes 
and for the customers that are coming in the door. And the number one factor in bringing value to the service department as a service advisor is building that relationship, not only with your customers to get them coming back to you to spend more money and to trust you that you're going to fix their car right, but to build a relationship with the guys in the back so that they're, they're getting the job done, they're working efficiently, and that their success equals your success in the job. And that's and that's this first step to it is just is making sure that you understand that you have to work cohesively with a lot of different parts. And unfortunately, a lot of service advisors are perfectly happy sitting at their desk, <clears throat> phones. You know, there's a lot of shops that are set up with they have receptions that take appointments. Then, you know, they have call centers that schedule oil changes. And as a service advisor, it's pretty easy to sit there and, and do nothing if you want to do nothing, you know, except for kind of just exist and waste space um but that's not really bringing any value it's i'm i'm the guy that's going to convince or talk to the customer about every recommendation they have to they have to have on their vehicle and the one of the ways you can do that is everybody you know we get the technicians everybody knows the waiters and the multi-point inspections the, the the free inspections that everybody has to do on a car and doesn't make you any money waiter's gonna wait <laughs> you know, it's I'm, I'm as guilty of that sentiment as a lot of people. And for years, I believe that waiters were just a waste of time. But the way to look at it now is that 90 percent of the business coming into a shop is going to be m basic maintenance type of people. People coming for oil changes, tire rotations. They're not going to make you any money unless, of course, you take advantage of the fact that they're there. You could wait all day for the guy who rolls in the door with a check engine light on or I got a vibration or there's a clunking noise going over bumps, something that might have some meat on it. But you got to face the fact that 90% of the people rolling the door want the oil change, want the tire rotation. They want the air filter. It's waste of time stuff. But those are the ones that you have the advantage of. They're in your shop. You can take a look at what's going on. If you take the time to do the inspection on the vehicle and put together a list of things the cars need, and you're working close with your service advisor, that service advisor is doing his job, then he's going to turn that seven-tenths oil change, tire rotation, into something that's actually going to make you some money. And you can help them out a lot doing that by basically working to prioritize what you find. I mean, even when you get something like a check engine light in, check out comes with a check engine light. It's, a, it's an EVAP code for a bad purge solenoid. Bad purge solenoid isn't going to make you a lot of money. But if you notice that it's got a bad purge solenoid and then now it's going to need front brakes, it needs struts, mm -hmm. it needs other work, you put up a whole estimate and you send it to a, a service advisor. Cool. My job's done. I'll let the guy do his job. $4,000, $5,000 estimate could be overwhelming for anybody. A service rider, it could be overwhelming for a customer. And if you pitch it wrong, then what you're going to end up with is a customer walking out of there like, well, these guys are trying to rip me off. I just came in for a check engine light. One, thing you can do, one of the things you can do as a technician to really help, especially an inexperienced service advisor, is, is lay out the priorities. Yes, the customer came in for a check engine light. This is what it's going to need to fix it. But... I noticed that they have bad ball joints in the front. Their rear brakes are worn down. They, you know, they're behind on their services. If you put all this up and you say, okay, well, this is the priority. This is the primary concern they came in for, but the safety issues have to be addressed first. If you prioritize them one through four, one through five, whatever it is, and tell the advisor, hey, look, we can fix a check engine light for them, but they're going to be driving down the road in an unsafe vehicle. Let the service advisor know, give them the consequences of what their inaction, what the customer's inaction would bring. Like, Everybody knows you let brakes go out, boom, you know, you have no brakes. But if you don't express that to the customer properly, you're like, oh, you need brakes. Well, okay, I'll get it handled at some point. It's not, nobody's going to voluntarily spend $800 it's because you said the magic word brakes, you know. So, so David, uh, just so help the guys understand so that, and, and there's service advisors like this out there. You, know, you you bring in as a technician you bring in this whole list you prioritized everything but the service advisor is still afraid to ask for that sale what 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 kind of advice do you have for for the techs on on that that you can one of the ways you can approach that and it's actually the way that it works best for me is is when you explain the consequences in a way that people can understand the, the what's going to happen yes. if they don't take action. <laughs> well, in extreme cases, yes, if you have to beat them over the head that hard, but I prefer a much more subtle approach. <laughs> yes. But as a technician, if you say, okay, well, look, 
the brakes are worn down, but here's, here's what's going on with it. And here's how much time they have realistically left. Here's what, you know, is going to happen if they don't take action on it now. And realistically, if you have to end up adding, you know, if you wait too long, you're going to end up needing this and that's going to double the price or triple the price. A service advisor who's scared to ask for a sale isn't going to want to sit there and tell a customer, well, if you don't do anything, it'll cost you more. They'd rather just talk to the customer now about getting it out there. But as the technician, that's pretty much all you can do is you can explain to the, te- the, cu- the advisor the extent to which that they need to address this with the customer. And if you have a service advisor who's not doing that, then as a technician, you need to have a conversation with your service advisor, with a service advisor or the service manager and be like, these guys need to grow a pair. They, you know, hard conversations suck, but it's a lot easier to have a hard conversation than know you send somebody down the road with a dangerous car because not just the liability in the world nowadays, but just the, 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 the thought of the moral responsibility. I don't want to be responsible for somebody driving an unsafe car on the road that they don't know about. If, if I tell you your car is broken and you drive it down the road and I've done everything I can to convince you not to drive it and you drive it down the road and smash into a pole, well, you know what? God made stupid curable one way. <laughs> David, there's a couple things on that. One, and before technology came abreast of it, I always like to take the customer out there and show them for the visual. The other one is what's your thoughts on these apps now that I think they're killer. We were talking to Dixon's Fixins Auto Repair last week, and he uses a photocopy app that goes and shows the customer that. Wouldn't that alleviate that issue for the service writer? To a certain extent, yes. Um, once again, it's it's more presentation at that point. The apps make it really, really great to, to take the customer really out into the shop and show them what's going on with the car. Um, especially if they're not there. The, that really works, especially too, if you have a customer who's dropped their car off for the day and they're not there to have the opportunity. Um, you know, other, other things that have made it easier, like Reynolds and Reynolds has their e-approval now where you can attach photos of damage to the vehicle and send it with a written estimate right to a text message, right to an email. So the customer can see the visual, they can see the estimate. And they basically start shopping on Amazon. Ooh, look, a pretty picture. Click, add to my cart, done. It, it really does make it for a rookie advisor or a younger advisor or an inexperienced advisor, a little bit of way to ease into it, but it takes away some of that, um, some of the ability for the advisor to really address the issue with the customer. It, it becomes, it becomes almost ma- machine. Like it's, 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 in, it's, there's no interpersonal and the interpersonal is where we're losing out a little bit when it comes to it for building that trust with the customer and, and building that relationship with the customer because the reality of it is, is you're not going to hit the $4,000 sale every single time, but a good advisor who's going to be bringing value to the shop is going to make a plan with that customer. When you send up the $4,000 repair order, okay, well, we'll fix the check engine like today, but we're going to schedule you an appointment for this, for this repair. We'll set you up with the loaner. We'll get you, we'll get it all taken care of for you. And we'll start by doing the ball joints. We'll start by doing this. And that way that customer is coming back over and over and over again and spending a little bit of money each time as opposed to one, a lot of money one time. And everybody wants the full yeah. sale. I mean, who doesn't want to bang out 12, 13 hours worth of gravy in a single day and be ahead? I mean, yeah. there's a technician out there who doesn't want that. Except for Bobby. Bobby just likes, you know, doing oil changes because he likes the way oil tastes. We'll see. <laughs> Zach had a question. Tastes like cherry Coke. I'm just saying. Zach had a question. What information do you have for a one-man show like me on the weekends? Uh, well, it, it depends on how in-depth you want to get. I mean, if, you, if you're really looking at to invest in it, there's a lot of apps out there. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but you can do uh, simple apps to, to kind of <clears throat> price and, and address everything. But if you're looking to just work with customers and, and do it more on the weekend by yourself, it really comes comes about as learning the ways to speak that, that aren't going to turn people off. There's words, there's keywords in sales that you never want to use with a customer when you're trying to get them to, to, to move forward with a job. And there's things you got to remember that you've got to compliment them. You got to make people feel good before they spend money. You know, oh, well, I've gone over the whole car. Everything looks good. Like you guys have been doing a great job taking care of the car, but there are a few things that need to be addressed. And we can address them, and we're going to address them. This is how we're going to address them. This is realistic for what the cost is going to be, and this is what the timeline is going to be. There's really only four objections. No! 
ever did that ever enter into saying no? <laughs> How to overcome the no objection as they're screaming it at you? And apparently, <laughs> one of them is having an objection right now. Well, that's my little list. Her favorite word is, in fact, no. Uh, I didn't realize that she was a service customer. Well, apparently she is. You know, you just slapped her with that four thousand dollar bill. She's gonna say no. Were her first words, "I have a coupon." <laughs> no, no, it's more like I have a group on. Uh, I know the owner. Uh, uh, I know the owner. <clears throat> but How many which times is particular- we get that at Cadillac? How many times does somebody come in and like, well, I talked to TK personally. Yeah, I do. I, I did I it every day. I still need to get paid. <laughs> Usually one of those exploding gas tanks behind his office wall by accident. Uh, <laughs> hey, I had to purge them. They didn't say how. A lighter with a gas tank works just as good to purge the fumes out of it as, like, you know, an EVAP canister. So, screw it. It was quicker and easier. I was flat and I had better things to do. <laughs> hey, you really didn't need those hairs on your arms anyways, right? They grew back. <laughs> Smelled a little funny in the short term, but you know, it just smell like burnt hair. Oh, never mind. I'll, I'll bring up one of those stories later. Oh, I shows. really wish I could remember which story he was talking about, and I hope it's not one that's truly well, embarrassing. There's, there's two of them. One of them was my fault. The other was just you being you. Ooh, teasers for later, guys. Stay tuned. I'm drawing a blank, so I'm looking forward to the story as much as everybody else in the room. Hey, it'll be like him reliving it for the first time. Was there alcohol involved? Because there it sounds like there must have been because he doesn't remember. There was there was quite a few years in my twenties where there was a lot of alcohol and drugs involved. There was uh boy. Yeah. There I Bobby, yeah, Bobby. we'll get to that later. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, so what I'm catching, Dave, is, is is so much of what you do is a relationship, not just a relationship between you and the guys that you're working with, but you and the customer. It, you get to foster that relationship. You get to be the one that ultimately, you know, hey, this is the plan that we recommend. We recognize that you may not have four grand to drop on this right this second. But, you know, here's the things you need to do to make sure that your car stays in one piece and you keep it shiny side up. Exactly. And and here's and with that, the <clears throat> one of the keys to it is that if you get a yes on any work, your probability and your likelihood of getting yes on more work goes up greatly. And the number of times you have a customer where you say, okay, well, we're going to start with the $1,500 repair and you get it handled and you're halfway through and they'll call back. You you know what? I was thinking about it. Let's go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and do that. And that's, that's part of the relationship building. That means that that dollar per RO or that average per RO average hours per RO goes from, you know, 1.8, 2.0 to all of a sudden 4.0, that's when you start seeing, you know, benefit for the technicians because everything we do in the shop is pretty much a, a waste is a, is a time suck pulling cars in, pulling cars out, you know, documenting everything you find. These are time sucks that you're hoping to get time back with the jobs that you suck. And this is one of the biggest things to stress. I was waiting for that to happen. Feisty, aren't you? Yeah, well, somebody had the audacity to drive down my road. How dare oh, they? Dare they? <laughs> that's, um, that's no problem. We're all family here. <laughs> so uh, Kane is uh, in the chat bleachers. Hi, Kane. Welcome to another Tuesday Night Live. Dick's Inspections. Uh, Gotta love the name. You know it. Great name. Plus, he's got that uh, that uh, Firebird Trans Am third gen F body. F body. Yeah, well, it's, it's easier to call it that. You get Bobby's stamp of approval over there. Anyway, yeah, he says he's do. what. Hell yes, he gets my stamp of approval. Anyone who wants a third gen. <laughs> Anyways, he says he's using Shop Monkey, and he'd be perfectly happy to uh, uh, send his personal inspection template. It could use some tweaking, but it's a start. You know, guys, that's you know part of why we're here. This is a community of guys. We're trying to make the best of everything we've got and improve and get better, and you know, ultimately disrupt this industry and make it into what we need it to be, what it really is, what it should be. Yeah. Not what it is, what it should be. Now, one of the things that I brought to my attention that I hadn't even thought of for years, when I had my shops back when, before I went training, we actually went to a finance place. It was called Blazer, Blazer Finances. And if a customer came in and couldn't afford to do the deal, we'd hand them, hand them an application. They'd go over, get it approved. They'd pay us and be done. Is, are no shops thinking of that? 
Uh, well, it depends. Like a lot of the manufacturers at the dealerships have some form of that. So I'm with Jeep right now, and Jeep has the you know the, the, the Chrysler credit card, FCA credit card, basically a branded credit card that you can apply for right at the service office. And once you're approved, if you're approved, you can use up to 50 percent of the total amount you're approved for that day, right off the bat. It's a great service to have for your consumer independent guys because you get the money, they pay you, they pay them monthly, you don't care. Well, that's that's one thing to look at if, if you're running a smaller independent shop is ways to, to provide these services for your customers because if you're taking the extra steps the guys aren't in these smaller shops, you're going to win business just by being more convenient. Absolutely. By, you know, even just things as simple as if you're going to, if you're going to swing it, just having a shuttle service or – loaner cars or pick up and drop off the service. I mean, with a lot of people still working from home, you know, if you can pick up a car at their driveway, you know, get everything handled and get it back to their house, then you're going to go to the top of their <clears throat> list of places to go to, to get their car fixed. And the more they're bringing their car to you, the more their dollars you're putting in your pocket. And it's just going to benefit you in the long run, even if it costs you a little bit of money on the back end. Well, you're right, David, because even on that one, I mean, I'd like to hear from the bleachers what the average distance is of most customers from their shop. You know what? Send them home on an Uber or Lyft and have the Uber or Lyft pick them up. It's going to be included in the invoice somehow because I can do that easily. But yep. it's that can, and they don't care as long as that car's work is, is fixed right and works perfectly. They don't care about the extra thirty, forty dollars. But not only that is that you, you know, that you can even find a way to maybe roll that in like you know get with some some of the local like uber drivers or whatever and, you know say, okay you know you're going to come here you know get the customer but not only are you getting the customer but that uber driver needs his car work on too yeah absolutely it's going to your shop exactly right. a couple of days to pick yeah. customers up wow this is a service that you guys provide cool i need well, my brakes done and, I will and, tell and, you, and we have the opportunity to put in a shameless plug here too <laughs> Remember that uh, uh, we at Mechanic Alliance have a an association with somebody that can help these folks if they need credit. So yeah, yeah, that's true. We've got Olympus Lending on hand, but what was the uh, finance here that you, that got brought up for the consumer side? Well, that was years ago. It was Blaze. I don't know if they're still out there, but but you know, even on that one, these guys, you a lot of these people up front forget too. When you get pizza delivered to the shop, does anybody talk to them about the repair on their car? Oh yeah. I, yeah. I used to do the work for the parts delivery company because we did the most in, in business with them and they had us do it. So yeah, there's a lot of money that gets left on the table. A lot. People that you interact with on a daily basis that, you know, you're concerned about the, their purpose as to why they're there. You're delivering me parts. Awesome. Take yeah. a quick look and like, Hey, you've got ball tires. That's four or $500 right there. Mm -hmm. You know, Like, and okay. Now, they're not out there alone. There's a fleet behind that. Well, and it, it's and interesting that cars that, that, that gets brought up is when, um, well, like Bobby mentioned, I've been a GM guy my entire career, except for a, a short beginning intro into BMW and Mercedes. But I've been a GM guy pretty much since I turned, started turning wrenches professionally. I recently switched to Jeep about a year and a half ago. Uh, it was an opportunity within the company I was working for, and I took it. And to my benefit, I like the shop better, I like the money better. And I like the people better. And Jeep customers, um, just like the letters spell, it's just empty every pocket. These people are nuts. You, you can write a five thousand dollar repair repair estimate on a Jeep Wrangler, and a customer will be like, "Okay, how long is it going to take you to get it fixed?" Well, here's a car. I'll call you in three days. Um, but one of the things that where we're located is there's a lot of enterprise offices around us, and they do have their own fleet of of repair shops that they use. They have their own shops. But nine times out of ten, if it's something they can't solve, they're looking for spreading, you know, spreading it all over. And I developed a relationship with the coordinator for the region for the for the repair. And now, because of we worked really hard to get uh, a lot of recalls handled very quickly for them, now every single car that they can't fix <clears throat> comes through our shop. Nice. And they're, they're bringing them as far away uh, from Rhode Island. They're bringing them from New Hampshire. They're bringing them from Vermont. They're bringing them from New York. They're bringing them from Connecticut, past other branded dealers that they could easily drop the car with, but they're bringing them to us because we're getting them fixed fast. 
and not uh, it's not all warranty. A lot of it's customer pay stuff with their fleet because of car availability. Their fleets are getting up there in the 40, 50,000 mile range. They're spending money to keep them running because they can't replace them. And that's mm -hmm. all. It's not going to be graveyard work like brakes and stuff like that. But you're getting cars in that, you know, need engines. You're getting sil cylinder heads. You're getting stuff that, that's going to be customer pay that they're just cutting checks for. And they just want it done as quick as possible. So we're doing, on average, through Enterprise, two month, two tra two engines a month, uh, a couple transmissions a month. Some of them warranty, but some of them are customer pay. And that's all bonus money in our pocket. All we got to do is maintain that relationship. So if especially if you're a smaller guy, reach out to the, to the businesses in your area that use fleet cars and put the word out there. Like, hey, man, I will give you guys priority. I'll give you special pricing if I have to. You know, sometimes it's just couple dollars off the, the stated labor rate. If you can do it a little bit cheaper than the guys around and still deliver quality work, you're going to, you're, they're going to bring it to you. Mm -hmm. And that's just more money in everybody's pocket in that regard. And once again, it just spreads the word that I'm willing to work with businesses, you know, the businesses yeah. afford to replace things like they used to. So they're going to fix them just like anybody else. Mm -hmm. So just as a quick uh, frame of reference, out those of us out here on the western half of the world, when you're saying you're coming from various states away, to us, that's like, you know, several hour drive, many hundreds of miles. We don't go state to state to state to state. <laughs> How well, many miles are they coming from? Because we all can we can relate to that. So where we're located, I mean, we, we've seen customers coming away, you know, about, about a three hour round trip. So you're looking at. We're from the East Coast. We're from Massachusetts. We don't do things in miles. It's all time. Ah. You know, we don't we don't give directions. And, oh, it's about four miles down the road. It's about 10 minutes down the road, guy. What you want to do is you want to take a look up in there. If you see the liquor store sign, you got, you take a right right after the liquor store. If you pass the second liquor store, you've gone too far. you got to bang you. We come back around. You forgot to mention that we also do it by Dunkin' Donuts because they are landmarks. And you can actually direct people by Dunkin' Donuts as to how to get places. Uh, oh, but to answer your question more succinctly, so when the, the commercial truck centers, mm -hmm. Enterprise runs, they're pulling cars from as far away as 100 miles. Wow. So, so does Enterprise ever fight you on labor times or any of that stuff? Or are they pretty much like, you do it, great, get it done? Nope. All they ask for is that, you know, we try to stick as close as possible to the labor time guide that we use, which, you know, we just use SPG pricing. Um, and... If there's anything extra needed, like special requirements, or we need to add more time in for difficulty, just as long as we break it down, and they're usually pretty good about it. They're, they're looking at it from the standpoint of the longer that car's down, the less money I'm going to get off of it. They, they don't care. Now, my experience with Enterprise has been that, of course, you're at the man you're the dealership, but my experience was total opposite of that, and that's because generally they only keep them like so many miles or so many years, and then they turn them. So are you doing anything outside of warranty work then? We are, and and that's and that's just a byproduct of the market we're in. They can't replace the cars like they used to, you know. We're oh, okay. The market's different. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I mean, there. Gotcha. Time was, you know, Enterprise would place an order with Ford or GM or Chrysler, and they'd get a thousand cars dropped off at of one that's of their true. distribution good centers, point. Good and it'd be no big thing. But now they're paying the, either the cost to replace them is too high, or they just can't get their hands on them. So you're seeing cars traditionally run up to 40, 50,000 miles. I had a 20, 2020 Grand Cherokee that had 45,000 miles on it in the shop just yesterday for a check engine light for a throttle body. $1,500 repair. Didn't even argue with me. Done, gone, got the part in, shipped. Bang. <clears throat> you know, it's, it, it's, it's one of those things. Like it's fostering those relationships that, that really add value. And the service writers play a big, big part in that in identifying who's around and trying to foster the relationships and providing that service to those people. That's the thing is that something as simple as a phone call when you promise to make a phone call makes a big difference. And that's, and that's where I see a lot of service advisors fail there. They're like, Oh, I'll just drop it off. And Oh, I got the sale. I don't have to worry about communicating with them. You know, but once again, the technology makes that easy emails, text messages. I have a, I have an app set up on my computer that I just, I can pull up the customer's phone number and just send them a text message from my computer. Say, Hey, Moving right along, still looking at four o'clock. We'll give you a call when it's done. You that's know? awesome. And that's not even new technology. That's no, been around no. for a long time, and a lot of people slept on it. Well, and ADP, that's just good application. ADP and Reynolds and Reynolds has done a lot of good work in integrating their that the kind of technology into their systems, where you can do it all from it from the desktop. I know there's some smaller services out there. I, 
I think I want to say it's Identifix, I think offers some kind of writing application now. Um, I know there's a couple out there for smaller shops and you, you definitely need to investigate and look and do ways to integrate technology to communicate with customers how they want to be communicated with. One of the questions I ask every one of my te- customers when they walk in is, how would you like to be contacted? Do you want a phone call? Do you want an email? Do you want a text message? You know, any of the co- above combination. And some people are so busy, like, yeah, just shoot me a text message. You know, they don't have time to pick up the phone or they don't want to talk to me, which is fine. <laughs> I don't want to make a phone call if I don't have to either. Yeah. Nobody but, wants to talk on the phone anymore. Exactly. And and that's and that's where working as a technician, you can kind of keep this mindset is stop and kind of think about it from, from both the writer and the customer's perspective of what's going to be easiest, what's going to be most digestible. And, and like I was saying before, there's really only four objections to getting worked on. It's time, money, convenience, and basically there's always the, uh, I just can't afford it, but that comes down to money. And that's where if you're smart about building, when you're looking at these cars, if when you're building these these recommendation lists is to really stop and think about like what could be the potential objection to this um, and kind of prep the, and kind of prep the advisor for it. Be like, Hey man, like tell them that if they can't afford it, you know, or if they're, if they're worried about time, if they're worried about money, if they're worried about this, like if you're doing a lot of work on a car, maybe it benefits you to, to tell the advisor, like, Hey, I'll shave an hour or two off this job. If they buy all these jobs. I mean, it sucks to say an hour or two, but if it means the difference between making the job a little more sellable and who knows, I've had ones where the techs are like, yeah, if we do the, you know, on a Jeep, a, a leaking oil filter housing, if we do that and we do the spark plugs, I'll do the spark plugs for an hour. Okay. So it saves $300 for the customer. Cool. I can pitch that to them or I can pitch it as, okay, well, we're going to do the whole job. I'll sell it for the full amount. And then if I find up, you know, find out that we need to do something else that's going to cost 300 bucks, I'm still in my estimate, you know, without having to call them up and say, Hey, I need an extra 300 bucks. I know you don't need it. <laughs> you know, because you know, money just flows freely nowadays. <laughs> oh, say so right into the gas tank is where mine goes. Yeah, pretty much. So Dave, how does someone like me who's a tech, communicate to you the importance of certain things if you don't necessarily understand the system of how the car works like you know somebody who got hired in that has a business degree or because they work retail you know one of the many things that i say to service advisors typically get hired because of um you know they really have no background in anything automotive how do we translate what we see to those people so one of the best ways is, is to approach me like a customer. Um, bring me out in the shop and show me what it is that we're dealing with. Because if you train the service advisor to kind of recognize what it is they're looking at, then you can educate them a little bit. I mean, that's the big thing. <coughs> the benefit of being a technician is we have, the, we have the education, we have the knowledge of how these things work, of how they work together, and what the consequences can be when they don't work properly. If you have that knowledge and you have an advisor who doesn't, Take the opportunity to educate him. Not only is he going to learn better and understand better and, and, and make it in, translate into better dollars, but he's going to look at you and be like, hey, you know what? You're helping me out, man. I appreciate it. So if something good comes, you know, maybe he'll, you know, he should be able to help you out on the back end. And that, that's the thing is really just be clear. It's, it's, it's really hard to, 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 under, to overstate the value of that. A lot of technicians, like I have a technician, great guy. He'll find a hundred things wrong with every car he brings in the bay. The stories he writes and the recommendations he writes could qualify for article of the month in Reader's Digest. Man spends more time <laughs> writing down words. I love it. And love it. then I could, th- then he should. And as a writer, I have a million things going on. I have the phone ringing. I got customers I got to call. I got estimates coming up. I got warranty companies I got to call. At any given point, I probably have three or four things going on. And I see this estimate pop up and I got to filter through all that <coughs> to get to the, the, you know, the meat and potatoes. It's going to, it's going to take me that much longer. So clear, concise information to the writer about what the recommendations are, what the consequences can be, you know, and approach it as a chance to educate the, the person. And, and then you'll see them get better. You'll see them get smarter. You'll see- <laughs> eventually start being able to do it, you know, 
either without having to consult you first or in worst case scenario, they'll say, hey, man, I have no idea. Can you help me out here? Can you explain this to me a little bit better? You know, they'll start looking at you as, as being the <coughs> and that if they're the sales talent, you're the information base. And then that's that's how you build a relationship. That's how you get them better is by approaching them in a consultative way. Like, hey, if you need any help, if you have any questions about how something works, come ask me, dude. I'm not going to bite your head off. I'm not going to put camera at you. you know? Now, here, here's a good one we haven't talked about. I know it's a big one because I've heard it many times, and so have David and Eric. You work at a dealership, you work at an independent, but that service rider is just favoring that other tech. How do you break that wall down and help him start helping you? Well, that's... It's kind of that's kind of a tough one because it, it is. That's it, why I wanted to see if you had any input on it because it is it's a really tough one, especially in a family situation. Well, it, it's you can figure it out. There's a couple ways. You also have to figure out why he's favoring that guy. I mean, there's there's a reason. Either they're old friends. If they're old friends, you're probably not going to break that wall down. The only thing you can do in that regard is push that much harder to try and educate them make him see the value in working with you, you know, give him clear, concise uh, uh, recommendations, make sure that the, the, the diagnostics you're giving him is not full of information he can use and get the jobs done quickly and efficiently without a lot of, a lot of pushback or a lot of argument. I know sometimes it sucks like your work, you're being pulled in five different directions, but if you got a service writer who's favoring a guy in the shop, there's a reason why he's doing it. And he's either doing it because the guy recommends the world and <clears throat> quickly and he's making the guy a ton of money. But realistically, it, it, the onus is on you to kind of sit back and observe and take a look at it. And maybe a little bit of self-reflection. Have you in the past pissed on that guy's shoes or did you guys get into it in the first week one of you was there? You know, was there a job that, that got fucked up between the two of you? You guys have words over, a, a you know, over a mispaid ticket, anything like that. Sometimes self, you know, self-reflection sucks, but sometimes you have to realize that you may be the fault for that. But really it's just, it boils down to making sure that you're as professional and informative on your job and make his job as easy as possible. If you make my job easy, I'm going to do everything I can to make your job easy. And that's, and that's not favoritism. That's just, you know, if I got a guy that every time I give him a ticket, it's going to be something good. And he's like, nah, fuck that. I got, you know, three other things I got to do, or I'm, I don't have time for that. Or I'm, I'm, I want to leave at 4.30 today and bail out. Guess what? Travis has a good statement, and I like it. It's exactly what you were saying, David. I hate to say it, but usually the reason they are favored is because they have proven themselves to that advisor. So I like what you're saying. Get Step, step back, take a look at it, see how you can intervene um, and prove to that advisor the same thing. Well, but bottom line is no matter who you are, no matter where you work, no matter how low you are on the rung, the ladder you are a salesman you have to sell yourself you have to sell your services and so david what you're saying here is when you've got a challenge with a service writer it's all about building the relationship what you've been talking about all along yeah and you've and, got to put yourself in the salesman's role and that's and that's that's a great way of putting it i mean you also have to look at it as, as as a technician you're almost a business of one you are you know let, let's face it buy our own tools we're basically renting space from the shop that employs us for, you know, what they give back to us. So we're a business of one. It's our job to market ourselves. It's our jobs to, you know, put out the quality of work that we want to be known for. You know, everybody knows the guy that can slap a set of pads and rotors on a car in 15 minutes and call it a good job. Okay. But it's the guy who's going to get the car in the bay and get it handled, get it diagnosed thoroughly. And that's one of the things that I can't stress enough is thoroughly. Like when it comes right down to it, everybody's, always talk about, oh, we don't get paid enough for diagnostics. That's one of those areas that you have to advocate for yourself. Be like, hey, man, this job is not an hour diagnostic. This job is not a half an hour diagnostic. This job is not going to take me 15 minutes. This job, and be real with that service advisor so he can be real with his customer. Be like, hey, you have a squeak noise. You have a rattle noise. It's I'm going to have two hours on this. And tell him to get that from the customer. So you're not going in, fighting an uphill battle, trying to rush through and you miss something. Same thing with... We've all had to deal with the car that's or other shops that nobody else can figure out. And as a service advisor or as a, as a technician, if the service writer is doing the job and getting the information and getting that that level of back information, history and what's been done, what hasn't been done, what's been tried, when it happens, how it happens, 
you need to look at the service advisor, like, look, man, like this is great information, but you're asking me to solve a problem that nobody else has been able to solve. And you're asking me to do it in an hour. That's not going to fly. You know, that's yeah. it's, it's not going to happen. You need to be able to walk up to that technique, that service advisor and be like, Hey man, I'll take tackle this job, but you need to watch out for me. Like call this customer say, Hey man, I need four or five hours to dig into this. One of the, like when I look at it, when I get a car that, you know, has come from four or five other shops that nobody else has been able to fix right off the bat. I'm telling that customer, you're looking at three or four hours worth of diagnostic and you're leaving that car with me. I'm not going to have you sit in the waiting room. I'm not going to have you calling me every hour looking for an update because four other people couldn't solve this problem. Guess what? It's our turn and I'm going to do it right. And I'm not going to rush my guys to do it because if we rush, we're going to break back in the same situation where you spent three or four grand with all these other shops that haven't been able to fix it. My guy's going to do it and he's going to do it right. But that's also too, when that job's done and that job's diagnosed correctly and we get it fixed, I'm going to look at that, that, that technician who went to bat for me and said, okay, I'll take this job on. Next time I get a 30K roll in the door, a customer says, hey, man, I need breaks. Guess what? You help me out. Here you go. But I try to spread those, those jobs around. I mean, it's, you know, everybody knows when you're working with cars, if it's, if it's a certain make and model, if it's got a certain amount of miles, it's probably going to need this kind of work. So you spread the work around, you know, I'm not going to just feed, you know, one of the things that I ran in my shop is a dispatcher was very, was very good friends with one of the techs and he would funnel him all of the jobs that you knew were going to turn into something else. And after about three months in my shop, the technicians were just grumbling about it. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to take over dispatching for a little while. I'm going to see how it works out. And we had a new service manager at the time and, he agreed with me, so we tried it out for a little while. And not to not not to say that I'm the greatest thing that ever walked into a shop, but it's just simple math. The guys got more work, they made more hours, they made more money, they were happier, and everything got better. Our return, our average per hour went up, our gross profit went up, even our technician average went up. Our gross average for the technicians. You're talking each one of my technicians is averaging about twenty thousand dollars in production a month, and not nine guys. You know, that's a big uptick from what we were at. We were struggling to do $10,000 when I started there about 14 months ago for a technician. So that's that's, that's where working with, the, working with the advisor and educating him, improving yourself, he's going to help you out, hopefully. I mean, if he isn't, then, you know, you need to have a little conversation with him at the back of the shop. Like, look, man, don't fuck me. I'm not here to fuck you. I just want to make money. You do too. And we work together. We can make money. So I've got a question for you. When it comes to cars coming in with noises or intermittent complaints, do you think it'd be valuable to have almost like cue cards written up for the advisors so that way they can reference it and know what questions to ask these customers when they come in with, you know, obviously you can't ask every single specific thing that's happening with their car because you can't plan for that. But having good, solid, general questions that you, your advisor can ask to get the text as much information as possible out of these customers, because the customer themselves probably doesn't know half the stuff that's going on with their car. They've just turned the radio up to hide half the noises. Um, so, you know, do you think there's there's a, a value in doing that? A hundred percent. The it comes down to once again back to my statement that I'm an advocate. <laughs> I have to advocate for my technicians by making sure I get as much information as possible. And if you have a service advisor who's not giving you good information on a write-up, then educating them on what questions to ask, how to ask them, you know, and just in general kind of to whittle away at the, at the nonsense makes your job easier. makes my job easier. And it also goes a long way to making the customer feel like you're actually directly addressing their concern. You know, they're, that they they're feel valued, that, they, that you're taking the time to understand what they truly is wrong with their car. So if you can uh, if you can work something up, like work with advisors, be like, hey, man, if you're dealing with noises, these are the questions you should be asking, um, you know, or if you're dealing with vibration, these are the questions you should be asking. If you, you know, if you run through and you create a list that you can hand to the service advisor, be like, hey, man, you this is what you should be asking if you get a noise complaint or if you get a vibration concern. And then they'll 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 snowball there. You'll actually be able to start getting better information to help you diagnose a car quicker, and it'll make everybody happier. Yes, Hazel, I understand you have to go out. 
Pat has a good question. Hold on, we're going mobile. <laughs> oh, oh, Jesus. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so, <clears throat> going mobile. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Here. Yeah, so so Pat's asking. He's saying here. Um, so I'm killing time on big jobs. So now my service advisor thinks he's just give me the same job in a short time slot, then a bolt breaks, yada, yada. I'm pissed off because I'm crunched for time, finished in this two point, this 10 hour job in three, and I have no wiggle room. How do I stop that? Well, basically you gotta, you can address this one of two ways. One, you can basically tell advisor blanket, you know, this is what I suggest on a job, but really, especially in the rust belt, if you're working with cars where you got, where you can have potential downfalls, you have to make the advisor aware that you're like, hey, man, I know the time quoted for this is 10 hours or I know the time quoted for this is three hours. There's a lot of corrosion. There's a lot of, you know, potential for breakage. Work it oh, into yeah. your estimate. I want to like, walk them right out there. I'd be like, see this bolt? This bolt's going to break. Like, trust me. <laughs> well, and that's, and that's one of the things. I mean, at first, when you're working with them, you can you have to do that. You may have to do that. But as you develop that relationship with them, come on, guys. As you develop that relationship with them, you know, they'll start to trust what you have to say. And and that and that comes down to to being honest about it and not just gouging for the sake of gouging, you know. Yeah. Well, if see now in Pat's in Pat's situation, what it is is okay, um, let's say let's say all the book work and everything says that it's a 10 hour job. Uh, Pat had, over the years, you know because of, of his experience, he's, he's developed uh, techniques and, and whatnot where he can do that 10 hour job in maybe six hours. So now the service writer says, like okay, well, next time that comes in, I'm just gonna quote six hours. No, it's not right. And, and book, time, book time is book time. If yeah. you got a writer who's, if you got yeah. a writer who's underselling a job, you need to have a conversation with him and if necessary the boss because book time is book time that's the job that's what the job pays yeah, they're not only cutting your hours they're cutting money out of the dealership doing that absolutely. too that, that's that's 100 percent. no manager no owner no general manager is going to be like huh yeah that's funny you let four hours walk out of the door now there are there are exceptions to be made like if you have if you have a really good customer and you know or you got somebody who's struggling to kind of pay for the job and you know you can get it done in three or four hours and you think you can get the job sold if you take like an hour or two hit, that's a decision for you and the writer to make together. But if you got a job that you can do in three hours and it pays 10, guess what? Your experience, as long as you're doing the job right, yeah. you, you've, or you've, earned, you've earned every right to that 10th. And why a service advisor would be cutting his own throat on yeah. the money he's making, yeah. that's, that's a guy who's done. That's an advisor who's either not confident in what he's doing or he's, or he's fucking, as much as I hate to say it, if he's selling a job for six hours, it's normally 10. Chances are he's selling it for 10 and the money's going somewhere else. <coughs> yeah. and, that's and one <laughs> thought is maybe it's just a, a shop scheduling thing. Like, uh, you know, this job is slated to take, oh, this long. You usually do it in this, except for that one time that things happen. Yeah, well, let's cram as much work as we can. That's yeah, and, and you but know what? If that's how the shop wants to run, it's all fine and dandy until that one bolt breaks. Yeah. Well, it's also it's also short sighted because <laughs> all you're doing is all, all, all the advisors doing at that point is setting up an unreal unreal expectation for everybody. Yeah. You're not you're not delivering a quality product at that point. You're not no, you're not you're allowing rushing your text through the job because you you over promised and you know now it's over promising versus under delivering. If that bolt breaks, well, yeah, I told you to be done in six hours, but well, and that's, and, that's, and, that's, and that's a situation too for for an experienced advisor. Be like, look, guys, this is this is what the job usually does. This is what it takes. This is how long it's going to take. There's a potential for breakage. If there's breakage, it's going to add more time onto it. It's going to be. I just had one. I've been amazingly enough an 08 Sebring convertible on the shop, and uh, the lady asked us to look at a clunking noise underneath. She needs end links. And she needs a couple other things. And there's some rust underneath there. And my text like, look, dude, there's a lot of rusted bolts underneath here. One of them breaks. It's going to send this job sideways. And I'm like, that's fine. And I called the customer. And I said, this is what the quote is. But you have to be aware that this is a potential for breakage. And mm -hmm. if it does, 
I can't put a price tag on how long it's going to take us to fix it. It's your choice. You know, just be aware that this $2,500 quote I'm giving you could very easily go to $3,500, if not more. And if you're straight, if you're upfront with them, you know, as a technician, if you're upfront with your advisor about it ahead of time going into it, chances are he's going to be upfront with the customer going into it and everybody's going to be on the same page. And that way you don't have to sweat the, the broken bowl. You don't have to sweat the, the rust. And that's, that's, that's just being developing a relationship with the advisor. And like I said before, if you're making his job easy and you're making his life easier, he's going to make your life as easy as possible. Because if I don't have to, if I have to tell, if I tell a customer, like if you come up to me and say, Hey, man, we need to put struts in it. Okay, cool. How much? This is what it's going to cost. Sell it to the customer. Great. Come up to me, you know, three hours later when you're all the way through, when you got everything taken apart. Oh, by the way, it needs strut mounts and it's going to be an extra $500. I'm going to be a little pissed. But as an advisor, I should also know that strut mounts are a potential. But me being a technician, that's one of the benefits I have. I know the strut mounts are going to be an issue on a car with 100,000 miles that we're putting struts in. But as, an, but as a technician, when you're working with a younger or less experienced advisor or a guy who doesn't have a mechanical background, just let them know. Like, hey, man, this is something that could be coming up. If it does happen, I want you to be aware of it. This is going to be an extra cost. They can hand that on to the customer and let the customer make the educated decision. Nobody likes being blindsided. I don't like being blindsided. The customers don't like being blindsided. The techs don't like being blindsided. So if you put a little bit of extra effort in at the beginning on the estimate side, it's going to make everybody's jobs a lot easier. And that technician and that service advisor are going to develop a relationship that is going to be beneficial because he's going to be like, hey, man, I can trust this guy. He's going to be straight with me and he's going to do the job right. And he's not going to rush it out the door just to make, you know, double time on it. And I know he's going to take care of my customers' cars. If I don't get yelled at by a customer who's angry because their check engine light came back on 24 hours after I sold them a $1,500 repair, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to be happy with the guy that puts me in that situation. I mean, I've sat in cars with customers while they cry because they spent $3,500. And guess what? We didn't fix the problem for that $3,500. Now I got to figure out a way to make that customer happy, make that customer trust us and get that car fixed for no more money outlay or realistically figure out, you know, if there's a way I can do it with no more outlay, because now all of a sudden everybody's working for free. You may have made money on the job, but if you didn't take the time to do your job correctly and you rush through everything, now all of a sudden that customer comes back, everybody's working for free, period. Yeah. You know, and nobody wants to work for free. We barely make enough money as it is. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just one of those, the, going back to everything. It's just in relationship you build with the advisor, build a relationship, develop a trust between the two of you, and you'll see the benefits for that. And, and it just it all rolls in one. If you do your job to a, to a level of professionalism and you do it thoroughly, that service advisor is going to work with you and be as professional as possible. And granted, we're not all professional. They're, you know, And there are some times that you, know, you just don't want to be professional. Like I have technicians that will come up to me after dealing with a customer on the phone. But you want to hug, like, I want to strangle somebody, but I'll take a hug. You know? <laughs> <laughs> good stuff so more and more relationships 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 it's like communication. it's almost real estate here you got to be good communication good relationships with the guys you're working with if you're not something's wrong best to look into that because you know communication is a two-way street in a lot of cases you know you, it might be you. yeah screaming profanities at each other across the shop is not constitute communication no. does oh, not sure. It, it can be cathartic, greatly cathartic, but it does not count as communication. I don't care what anybody has told you. It is not communication. Bobby told me that just the other day. I've heard Bobby say those words. <laughs> I'm sure you have. Oh, you know, I'm sure you have. I've thrown tools at service advisors. I have thrown parts at service advisors. You've thrown tools at me. You You're a service me. advisor. I wasn't a service advisor then, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, preemptive neither strike. One of us, neither one of us has thrown as much tools and as hard as Jimmy G used to. Uh, this dude would stick wrenches into walls. That's how hard he would throw them. Like, brick walls. Like, he would break the, the glass on his door and the, over the dumbest shit. Like, try, he couldn't do a serpentine belt on a North Star like it was fighting him. And, if you've done the serpentine belts on the on the North Stars, you know trying to get it around the pulley around the Rainy. back it goes like it's a pain in the ass. But like if you saw him doing something like that, 
you best be keeping your head down. Because <laughs> they, they, it's just with it just it would be like that. He would just be fucking shit and whip something across the shop. Sounds like he needs a trip to Dunkin' Donuts. There's there's, there's one thing I do want to bring up, and this is not and this isn't going to be a, a shot at Bobby. This is going to be kind of a, a learning experience because Bobby's learned from it as well. Um, we both started in the same dealership coming out of ASAP. And there was two very different mindsets, approaches to kind of how we were going to do the job. Bobby was very much, I'm here to work on cars. I'm going to work on cars. I'm not here to sweep floors. I'm not here to empty trash barrels. Call me when you have to work for me. Whereas I'm I'm an anxious person. I'm an anxious person. I, I have a lot of nervous energy. I can't just stand around and do nothing. I, I get into work and I'd be like, hey, man, you guys any work for me? No. Okay, cool. I'm going to go sweep floors. I'm going to go empty trash. I got to do something to stay busy. And... It's not saying that my work was any better than Bobby's because I think in the beginning we were, you know, Bobby had a little more experience than I did when it came to get like the actual internal workings of a car. But over the next year or so, my building relationship and being willing to help and go out of the way for people, uh, for the service advisors, for the shop foreman, it allowed me to get more and more time with the the more experienced guys in the shop and the service advisors would make sure I got work and they, you know, they'd help me out a little bit and I would start working with the foreman and it took a step, took me and Bobby down two very different paths. And, you know, it, it, Bobby's stubborn. You know, you can, you can explain, you can explain some stuff to him and you'd have better luck convincing a brick wall to do, a, to do gymnastics. Um, so, but it took, and, and he, and he eventually I love this guy. It, he was like, wait a minute. Okay, I'm doing something wrong here. He hasn't given up any of the, the traits that make Bobby Bobby, but he has learned to adapt himself a little bit to uh, to be a little more cooperative, I guess is the word I'd be looking for. Um, <laughs> Professional? How dare you? Huh? <laughs> Professional? <laughs> but, uh, and like I said, it took us down very different paths. Yeah, and, I quit. <laughs> I love Cadillac, <laughs> and I stayed. I stayed right up to the bitter end. The last day when they when they the dealership was closing down to uh to uh GM's bankruptcy, and you know that led me down to a private shop that I got screwed at pretty heavily. And that's actually how I got into being a writer. After a couple months of that situation, I got burned out, and I just I took a couple months off, and I realized how good I felt not being hunched over a car all day. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go be a service advisor. It'll be easy. I've learned that 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 isn't the fact, but it's physically I've I know that I'm in a lot better shape now than I would have been if I kept wrenching on cars. Yeah. But it's oh, what are you doing? Never mind. Um, but it's it's one of those things like if you're gonna if you're gonna develop if you're gonna go to work every day, you got to develop relationships with the people, and you got to develop relationships with people <clears throat> that are you're gonna be working with to make money. You don't want to go to work to not make money. Find the people that are making you money utilize them if you got guys that are making you money and you got to figure out okay is, is he's not making money for anybody can i train this guy to make me money hell yeah make his job easier he's going to make your job easier and, and everybody's going to make money and be happy i mean it's it's just value added and it's just like the the talent pool from a technician standpoint good technicians are getting harder to find good service advisors are getting harder to find and the dealerships aren't investing in in training a lot of a lot of dealerships have moved to a model of having one primary seller and just having everybody else kind of greet and write up customers. And it's one guy who does the selling. That's not sustainable because that guy is either very, very good and he'll be, you know, recruited somewhere else or he's nearing retirement and just doesn't give a crap and he's going to leave. And then what do you got? You got a bunch of guys who wouldn't know frigging their ass from an elbow and, on how to sell a job. And all of a sudden everything just tanks because the dealership they want to invest in talent or invest in training, and now you got nobody who knows how to do the goddamn job. It's like forcing out your your A tech to hire a bunch of lube techs. That you know I can hire five guys at the same price I pay this guy. Cool. Who's gonna diagnose the hybrid? Not the kid who changes the oil and or go goes to change the oil on a Subaru and drains the differential. And Bobby's smiling because he's seen it happen. Way too many times. Way too many times. And then all of a sudden the vehicle won't start because you pumped in five quarts on top of the five quarts that you didn't drain out of it. And now, you know, the it needs a battery. Now it's got a battery and 10 quarts of oil. I mean, yeah. it's. So I'm, I'm just going to blow up your spot a little bit about, you know, 
what happened at Cadillac. The one thing Dave forgot to mention is that that little shop he went to afterwards that he got screwed at was run by the shop slash service manager of Cadillac when it closed. And all of the times that he did favorites for him came back and bit him in the ass, and he got little buddied way too many fucking times. <laughs> yep. But I get little buddied a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm a guy who likes to help, and there are people out there that take advantage of it. Even the last shop I was at, the service manager, great guy, good friend of mine, but when push came to shove and anything needed to happen, he was a service manager, but he was checking out at 4.35 o'clock, and he wasn't working weekends to fill in shifts. I was the guy doing the open. I was the guy. Working. I was the guy working filling on Saturdays when other advisors couldn't make it. And it's just you know, it's my 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 approach has always been the job just has to get done. Somebody has to do it. It's going to be me because frankly, if I leave it up to anybody else, I'm going to have to go back and redo it again anyways. Yep, that's and some, my mentality changed after a few years. Like, <clears throat> Filling for people who went out on Friday night, you got way too drunk. Hey, whoa. And, well, I always showed up to work. I, was, I wasn't talking about you. I was talking about Jorge. Um, <laughs> but I would get calls at yep. seven thirty in the morning on a Saturday. This is when I worked at Saturn. Ooh. You remember those plastic cars? Um, and service rider be like, "Jorge's not here. Can you be here?" And I'm like, "Okay." I'm like, I also went out drinking last night, but. Yeah, and I'd hop in the Trans Am and be there in 15 minutes, and they'd be like, we just called you. I'm like, don't ask questions. I'm here. What needs to be done? <laughs> and, you know, I'm hungover. Like, I'm like, somebody get me some water. I need some donuts. Like, I, I need something. And just you know, and I was telling the service advisor, I'm like, look, just pull the cars in whatever empty bay, throw the ticket on whoever the box is in front of it, and I will just – and I'm running four bays at once. And he shows up at like 9.30 like, I drank too much last night. I'm like, good for you. Go home. I'm over. Stay drunk. That's the level yeah. of story. Like, anyway, guys, we are hitting the hour mark. And uh, if nobody wants to hear that much longer. We'll have to have both of you guys back on possibly another yeah. time for uh, massive storytelling. <laughs> yeah, we got to do another one of those. That was fun. Oh. Because I know that both of you have enough dirt on each other. We could go all night. Oh, we for could. sure. We could. <laughs> I appreciate it, David. Great job. Oh, so. It was a pleasure. And, you know, I'm here and available whenever. I mean, like I said, I'm not going to profess to be the world's greatest service advisor. But having been a technician, I understand that it it's a battle nowadays to try and get, you know, good quality people around you and make yeah. money off it. And if I can help out in any way, shape, or form to help people make more money, educate them a little bit better, or frankly, just try and make the, the industry a little bit friendlier to the people that make the industry run. I'm always here to help. Yep, Sounds he's good. in the group. I've seen him uh, post up a few times, guys. If you have service writer, you know questions, you know, feel yeah. free post them up. We'll make sure we get uh, we'll get him pointed at the right person and uh, see if we can get some you know clarification on that. Because guys, we want to make this as, as as good as possible. We don't want to have have everybody fighting each other. So that's how management wins is when we fight each other. That's right. Yeah. So anyways, we'll catch you next week. Same time, Tuesday night live, six o'clock mountain standard time, which is five o'clock on that coast and seven o'clock on the other coast. Who's next week? Don't have one yet. We're trying to get our insurance person on because there have oh, been okay. lots of insurance Angie. questions. Okay, cool. So got to get cool, her cool. lined up, but uh, we'll right, work cool. on that. All right. Sounds so, great. Anyways, thanks for, thanks for watching guys. Thanks, David. Always a pleasure. See you guys later.